Okay, classic game club, 2005 All Ireland Football Final, Kerry against Tyrone. We've done two Kerry games in the classic game club. What are we? Episode 12, 13, uh, two devastating losses for Kerry out of the two Kerry episodes we've done. Spotting a trend? Uh, I think so. Ger, this is your shout. Tommy, you're welcome as well. Ger, why did you want to do this one? Because this is one of the few times that I can remember two all time great teams going up against each other close enough to the peak of their powers. Sorry, just not, not to make me feel painful or feel sore about something that happened 15 years ago. This is just to do with the quality of the game. Uh, well, no, this is also to, wind, to remind you that the team of the Naughties was indeed Tyrone and to uh, piss you off. I actually want to do a deep dive in this whole three-game series. I think uh, I actually want the next two episodes to be the other two games either side of this so we can round out and give a full picture of just how dominant Tyrone were against this Kerry team and that's a good idea I mean it is a good idea right but I, like all, all joking aside though and, and winding you up aside because we've got a full 45 minutes to do that mm. I, I do want to make the case that this is legitimately one of the few times that I can remember where there are two absolute all-time great teams going up against each other you've had two hall of very good teams up against each other in in uh, years around this you would say the Mayo team are an all-time very good team as opposed to all-time great team. Dublin didn't have a rival who you would put in the top three or four teams of all time on their way to the five in a row. But this Kerry team, the majority of the one between four and six All-Irelands, this Tyrone team broke a, 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 a county's duck worse than a famine, Mayo people, worse than a famine, and won three All-Irelands in a five-year span. So these are absolutely two titans of the game playing in the Ireland final in glorious sunshine and uh, yeah it was a close enough game yeah it's not uh, not a bad set of criteria that it's ticked all those boxes really I think Tommy where were you for this what do you remember where was I god I, I don't I don't remember where I was watching this but I know that this game had a massive impact on me growing up as uh, a young lad who was crazy about football why that's right because uh, I actually just got it as I watched the game back, how much I loved Philly Jordan and Brian McGuigan and the likes of Declan O'Sullivan as a footballer when I was growing up. When I was 12 years old and I, w- I was not very fast when I was 12. I was not very good at catching the ball when I was 12. I was tall and I was lanky and I was a bit awkward. But I, I kind of, I really improved as a footballer from the age of maybe 12, 13, 14. And that's when I kind of started really becoming obsessed with wanting to be a, a Gaelic footballer and wanting to play it when I when I got older and when I was 12 Tyrone Kerry happened so it's no coincidence that my favourite player growing up was Brian Wigan and when I played wing back as a kid I wanted to be like Philly Jordan like it was there, were, there wasn't mid footballers that I wanted to be like of course I love Graham Gerdy but the, the two players that I wanted that I lo- loved more than anything were Brian McGuigan and Philly Jordan and it kind of reminded me why that was like McGuigan was just unbelievable in this game and Philly Jordan like I don't know why I didn't like Tomas O'Shea over Philly Jordan I just really liked Philly Jordan as a footballer he just had that cutting edge and that I don't know what he had but that's kind of what this game brought back to me I don't remember watching it but I do know that this game made me obsessed with football Were you working at this one Ger? I, I, I don't think I was I'm pretty sure I was um, at home watching this on the couch my abiding memory is at some point in the TV coverage and I couldn't see it um on the YouTube channel, the YouTube stream that we watched, there is a behind the goals. It might have been on the Sunday game that night where they had the behind the goals camera of the Canavan goal. And I legitimately thought that it was one of the best things I've ever seen in sport because it was kind of a, it's like a, a ballet where Jordan's long ball comes in and there's a brilliant fetch. And you can see from behind the goal exactly the, the arc of the run that Canavan makes. And then you can also see there's a little curl and a bounce it takes the ball away from Dermot Murphy as Canavan finds the one spot of the goal where the giant hulking frame of Dermot Murphy won't reach it. And there's no blasting. There's like all of his career comes down to this single moment just before half time in an all Ireland final against Kerry to define their greatness. And he passes. And he's injured. He's injured. And there's no, there's no, there's nothing in his mind other than there's one spot where this is going. It's got to go in the right spot and I'm going to score it. And yes. And uh, as his jersey gets ripped off him at the end, I wasn't sure if, Gooch had ripped his jersey or the fans had ripped his jersey as they hoist him shoulder high. Uh, but that's my body memory of, of actually watching it at the time. I've never seen anything as beautiful as this. Chair, I can confirm that that, that angle that you're talking about, because like, that is imprinted in my brain. That was on... I'm not, I'm not sure if you're talking about the slow motion angle, but there is the behind-the-goal angle 
of Muggsy fetching the ball. And yeah. I'm actually, can I actually turn the camera and show it on my laptop here? Because it's, it'll just show you how far away Peter Canavan is. Look at the height of Muggsy there. Can you see that all right? I know it's a great oh, wow, enough yeah. image. And then yeah. look how far Canavan is when that ball comes to him. And then... Sorry, the, pause, pause, then, pause. Ah, I know. I don't know whether we get away with that, lads, but like, that's worth showing. <laughs> like, and that is like one of the all time great All Ireland final goals. It was, it was, I got tweeted last night by a, uh, a friend of mine from the Iron Islands who's a, a big footballer over in Galway. And he was listening, I think he was listening to one of the classic game clubs, and he sent me the Declan Meehan goal, the Paul Clancy pass we were talking about. And he said, Name a better All Ireland final goal. In terms of like, iconic status and something that I remember this goal was unbelievable yeah I agree it's, it's, it's the most famous All-Ireland final goal I think bar maybe one of the own goals uh, that Mayo scored in 2016 like as, as far as like <laughs> finding the back of the net go oh no and sorry Owen Merchant Owen Merchant will, will always go down as uh, one of the greats uh, in terms of a green flag that was raised in an All-Ireland football final I'm just trying to think uh, nothing kind of comes close Shane against Kerry as well maybe. yeah uh, well no I mean it, sorry what I meant to say there is this entry that's a, a okay, key part okay. that I uh, left out there uh, <laughs> as we're like, seeing the goal again we'll, we can pet it out because this part might get popped for copyright <laughs> <laughs> yeah one of the great goals sorry uh, I got excited from, I got excited <laughs> one, one of the great goals from All-Ireland Football Finals uh, this game was uh, my first introduction to a thing called the Nally Terrace I'd never heard of it before the 2005 All-Ireland Finals so Perfect bird's eye view right in front of me. Peter Canavan putting that into the back of the net. Uh, just to go through some of the context for this All Ireland final, um, All Ireland champions of all three. Birth can of I interrupt champions. you? Sorry, you had, yeah, yeah. Go back here. Why is yeah, that? Come on, on, come on. Yeah, What's exactly. On? Come on. Your face is relaxed, but actually inside your, uh, you know, a steaming mass. This is this is your contradiction here, Owen. You're you're raging, and yet you're sad, but you're also kind of grateful that you had such a great team who was the second best team of the decade to cheer on for so long. Yeah, like I mean, it's uh, it's not not a nice feeling going back to watch this game. There, there's no two ways of putting it. It's not a pleasant feeling. It's not. Uh, it's just it's a strange thing to talk about because everybody's like, oh, you at least you went and you won the All Ireland the year before that, and you won the two the year after that. But there's something about all these Tyrone games that really hurts. I've never watched this game back before. Now I do like it'll be tattooed on the inside of my forehead for the rest of my life seeing Peter Canavan score that goal right in front of us. I can almost remember exactly what my dad was saying, exactly what the randomer who was standing beside us, we were actually like, I, w- I would think I was up on his shoulders or actually up on the concrete wall at the very back of the Nally as these conversations were taking place around me at the time where everything just kind of felt it had just fallen to pieces at that moment. That Peter Canavan's goal was so unbelievably significant in the journey of this All-Ireland final. It was before half time, but people knew at that, at that, at that uh, moment, it was like, oh my God, we are in severe trouble. And to be honest with you, like you, you, then it's just kind of like a revolving door of Peter Canavan's name throughout the second half. Like, like, of course, it's not this week that I realize that Peter Canavan comes off the bench. It's one of the most famous pieces of football trivia. And, and it feels like it's something that I'd never forgotten almost. I don't know. It's, like, it's a hard thing to sum up because I think watching it back, you get a greater appreciation of how deserving Jerome were of the All-Ireland on this occasion. But at the same time, there is almost the same feeling you get while watching episode three of Star Wars, where you're watching Anakin become Darth Vader. And you're like, I know what is going to happen here, but it is still heartbreaking to see all these steps getting achieved on the way to uh, the darkest end game happening. And seeing all these <laughs> things, like you can't get any happiness out of Gooch having a few good moments here and there, Seamus Moynihan looking good at the start, because you all know things will go steadily downhill. And it's, not, it's, it's just a terrible, terrible viewing experience. That, that can be true, but it can also be true to actually take your cap off and credit to Rowan for how unbelievably brilliant they were in this All-Ireland final. I would say, and if we're getting, staying in the bubble of the 21st century, the most complete All-Ireland final performance by a team. Were you tense watching it? Did you think that you had a chance at any point? Were you like, oh yeah, come on, that's it, we're, 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 go on. Like rewatching it or watching it the first time? Rewatching it. <laughs> um, like, of course, when, uh, when, when Darryl Kaneda scores that goal, you're like, are we watching the, the right game here? Or are we sure that Kerry actually lost this game? Because Gooch, Gooch is looking pretty good. And then uh, Pascal McConnell <laughs> comes racing out a goal and uh, t- tells, tells Gooch where to go, <laughs> which, which we will get into. Uh, which we'll get into. And I don't, I don't want to come across... Like, I, 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 what I'm, 
everything I'm going to say throughout the next little while is actually how what I was thinking at the very at, at the very time. I am going to say things about certain tackles that went into carry players that I felt at the time. But I can genuinely say this from the bottom of my heart. My overall emotion after watching this is fair play to Rowan. Like, absolutely fair dues to you. And any Kerry person who can look back at the 2005 final and not say that, well, they've got a serious case of sour grapes going on. We can get into 2008 some other time. We can get into the team of the decade perhaps today. But on 2005, as a classic game, which this is, it's a classic game club, anybody who says to Rowan we're not fully deserving of being All-Ireland champions in 2005, is talking nonsense. I think we will get into all of that. I think one thing is very, very, very clear from the outset. And, oh, and I know, I know you're speaking for your people here. Kerry's psyche was so brittle when it came to Tyrone. You're talking about a goal before half time. You're talking about a man who was injured. Peter Canavan, regardless of how many people call him God, is not God. Yet Kerry were beaten in this game. They were unbelievably good in that first 10 minutes. Kerry were off the charts good. Tomas O'Shea scored, like Canavan gets reintroduced and O'Shea scores that goal and the game should have been Kerry's. When Kerry came up against her own, they were brittle. Well, I've, got a, I've got a theory on that and I just want to go through like, a couple of bullet points I have for context considering okay, we tend to okay, go through this okay. uh, every week. So ju- just context, as I say, 03 champions against 04 champions, 05 overall. This is an unbelievable year for Tyrone. Let's not forget the 10 game all-Ireland winning streak. It's something Mayo tried to go close to a couple of years ago, but it's always held up now as possibly the greatest All-Ireland's ever won. Sean Kelly said as much before handing Brian Dewar Sam Maguire afterwards. Nine games up until this point. Cavan take them to a replay. Armagh beat them after a replay in the Ulster final. Dublin take them to a replay. And then they win uh, against Armagh in the All-Ireland semi-final. The trilogy, that is a trilogy that's worth doing as well. Pipped them by a point. Kerry, on the other hand, a vastly different journey to the All-Ireland final. Go through the front door. They beat Cork by 13 points in the All-Ireland semi-final. But really, context, the only thing that matters is 2003. That is the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter uh, uh, that it's two previous All-Ireland champions going up against one another. It is the semi-final of 2003 that matters in the context of this. And I'm not sure brittle is the right word, Tommy, but I wanted to actually get into the, the psyche of Kerry after 2003. And my theory is that the worst thing that has ever happened to Kerry football, maybe not the worst thing that's ever happened, but certainly a very bad thing that happened to Kerry football was Pat Spillan and his puke football rant in 2003. So what that gave was if you were a, an impressionable Kerry football fan sitting down watching that 2003 All-Ireland semi-final, you would come away from Pat Spillan's comments thinking to yourself, right, I can't believe the bad guys have won. The bad guys have actually won. But do you know what happens? The good guys tend to win out in the end. Those bad guys are going to get beaten eventually because the way they are going about playing football is bad. It is not the right thing to do. It is puke. It is vomit. If you stick two fingers back your throat, you produce your own football. That is what Pat Spillan is saying to me. However, if Pat Spillan had been filled with a bit more nuance and actually said, look, there are certain elements of what Tyrone are doing which perhaps uh, aren't in the best of taste. Like, we can get into that in a while. But... Uh, as, a, as a pundit, I'm also going to point out the amazing things that Tyrone are doing. Their swarm defence, absolutely sensational. Their possession football, absolutely revolutionary. The running, the fitness, on a completely different level. Perhaps then Kerry people might have looked at them and said, well, God, we are, the, we, or so we say, we are the best footballing county in the, wor- in the country. Imagine if we managed to, to combine some of what we do well with what Tyrone did well in 2003. Let's work on our swarm defence. Let's turn Tomas O'Shea and Mark O'Shea into hard-running defenders because we have the players to do this. Let's make this a 15-player game. Few players, get, Well, 14 players, the goalkeeper wasn't that involved back then. But players can pop up in any other part of the pitch because we are the best footballers in the country. We can absolutely do this. We don't have to resort to the dark arts all the time, although we probably should. But there is so much from what Tyrone did in 03 that we can take forward. But they didn't. And I'm not sure if that's a, a brittle psyche, Tommy. I think that might be just an air of arrogance. Hey, well, sorry, you're right. You got, it, you got it at the end there. It is an air of arrogance. And it's not Pat Spillane's air of arrogance. It's the entire county's. It's the, it's the sense of entitlement that you have when you have 30 All-Irelands already banked. And you know what? 32. Maybe that's the whole... Well, at that stage, was it not? By 03, it was 32. Was it? Okay. Is it 36 now? 37. Okay, right. See the way they know all these numbers. It's like you, you mistake uh, Robbie Keane's cap total or a gold number and you correct it straight away. Uh, that's exactly the arrogance that we're talking about. That's, this is what happens when you become an empire. You become fat and lazy, like what happened in Britain. You just become, oh, look at us, bloated on our own success and cash and too, oh, too like, wobbling my way past. 
I'm sick of that Northern crowd up there. If they were set dancing twice a week, we'd all be set dancing twice a week. It's an immortal line, but it wasn't Pat Milan who said it. Like, that's the thing. I think you're, you're right. It was arrogance to think, well, our footballing skills are going to eventually work our way through this. But when you run into that brick wall, when Declan O'Sullivan gets surrounded by six or seven guys, even Tommaso Shea got caught in possession once or twice in the mm. game. I was like, Jesus Christ, I didn't expect that. I think um, you got there in the end. It wasn't Pat Milan's fault. No, but I think, I think it's an important kind of uh, note to, to pick up on. Sorry, Tommy. I, I just think that it's the most famous thing that's been said. And like, I think people bought into that. People bought into this idea that Tyrone were the bad guys. And it was a nonsense. Like, I, I, and it's really frustrating. Like, how, how good would, the, uh, would especially Mark and Tommaso Shea have looked in that Tyrone team, for example? Perfect players in that system. Like, I mean, but you can't say that they were any better than, than Ricey or Philip Jordan. Like, they already had those players. Ricey, at the end of the game, was the fastest player on the pitch. I couldn't believe it. It was yeah. amazing. Ricey was unbelievable. But my point is that even just a little bit of the nuance that Tyrone managed to bring to the pitch, and in fairness to what Mickey Hart managed to bring to the pitch, if that was actually instigated and carried, if they had a plan B, for example, who knows what might have happened. I just think that there are so many regrets, and we should, there was yeah. so much underachievement, actually, that you, you, you think could actually be the end result of, of those few years for Kerry. Um, ju- just on that, uh, on a, like I, I, I agree that perhaps brittle is the wrong word, but arrogance certainly isn't the right word for what happened to Kerry in the midst of that game. Like, it was there for them. Arrogance perhaps in the build-up, but even during that game, at multiple times, that game was there for Kerry to win. But there was something in their heads when it came to Tyrone, and it wasn't just arrogance. There was something else there. I agree, yeah. There, def- there definitely was. There was, there was. there was a hoodoo. There was definitely a hoodoo. But what, what is the uh, psychological element of a hoodoo? Is, is, oh, hey, like... Sorry, I, I, is it not just that, they, that, that Kerry didn't tactically prepare for the onslaught, even though they had watched all of those games that year that Toronto played and they'd gone up against this same team and, and knew exactly what to expect, but they hadn't changed their game plan enough? Like, it, I, they, I, they didn't... I, so I, I kind of... The... Plan for Dewar. What was the plan for Dewar? Why are they taking Galvin off? Why are they taking know. Moynihan off? Like I, none of these decisions make that much sense. Uh, hindsight, blah blah blah. But like, also, why didn't they protect Gooch? Can like, I just say one Gooch more thing? Came... Go on. Uh, on top of all that, where the hell was Kieran Donny? On you substitute. Like they lumped, they lumped ball after ball into the square. Kieran Donny emerged in the scene in the 0-4 underdogs. He's sitting on the bench throughout 2005, played in the league. Don't tell me he wasn't ready. Kieran Donny is footballer of the year next year in 2006. Don't tell me yeah. that he's not ready in 2005. The decade, the team of the decade is sorted if that man is on the pitch. Uh, Jack O'Connor brought on Mike Frank Russell. He brought on Darren O'Sullivan. And then he ended up bringing on Infus Morris and Brian Sheen towards the end. And what happened in the last 15, 20 minutes, and it happened in the first half too, ball after ball went into the carry for forward line. And Chris Lawn, he's not going to be my second match. But Super. Chris Long was an unsung hero when he came on for Joe McMahon in that second Sensational. Yeah, he was unbelievable. But Kerry, but Kerry played into their hands. Darrow Shea, I love Darrow Shea, but like, Darrow lumped a couple of balls in, Tomas lumped a couple of balls in, and Gooch and Mike Frank should have had them, and they were beaten. Donahue was ready. And if you're talking about regrets, if you're talking about arrogance, if you're talking about things that Kerry did wrong, not having a plan B, their main problem was that Kieran Donahue was sitting on the subs bench. They're, you're saying that they didn't even do plan A correctly with the resources that they had at their disposal, which is, which is true. Just to, to go through the teams as well here, um, like, as you say, I, I think there is uh, a bit of appreciation we should take from the two lineups here. It's possibly the best football final we've had this century and two, two of the best lineups. Sure, you're about to say something before I get into the teams there. You're right, you're right, you're right. Exactly that. Like, we should, we should admire the fact that these... This is two all-time great teams going up against each other and it goes down to the wire. And I can only imagine, like, because you know how tense it gets now in these All-Ireland finals. Like, how tense it was last year for the draw game. It was unbearably, it was so quiet in Crow Park for about 10 minutes. Where everyone was like, Jesus, I don't know what's going to happen here. <laughs> and you imagine what that atmosphere must have been like for Tyrone and Kerry. Like, Jesus Christ. Do you remember that, Owen? Yeah, you're like you're you're definitely paralyzed by it, but I, I'm I think I, I don't like what age is I like eleven, so you, you don't fully appreciate it at at that age. Like I think uh, I, I certainly wasn't any more tense than I've ever been in my entire life than I was during the drawn game, for example, last year. I think the older you get, the more these worries actually tend to bog you down in the middle of a match. So I was still fairly blasé about it when I was eleven years old, but it was still devastating, absolutely devastating. And Peter 
Canavan, like just thorn in the side. Uh, the, the full to own side, uh, Pascal McConnell in goals, Ryan McMenamin, uh, Joe McMahon and Mickey McGee was the full back line. David Hart, Connor Gormley, Philip Jordan in the half backs, and the McGinley and Sean Kavanagh, a fairly formidable midfield. Brian Dewher, the captain at wing forward. The other half forwards are Brian McGuigan and Ryan Mellon with an, a sensational full forward line of Peter Canavan, Stephen O'Neill and Owen Mulligan. Kerry then, Dermot Murphy in goals, Mike McCarthy, Aidan O'Mahony and Tom Sullivan, the full back line. The two O'Shea's and Seamus Moynihan at halfback, Darrow O'Shea and William Kirby was the midfield. Liam Hassett, Declan O'Sullivan, the captain, and Paul Galvin, the half forwards. And then Gooch, Darrow, Canada and Owen Brosnan made up the full forward line. And yeah, like the, the Kerry tactic was to get the ball in, route one to Gooch, even if it is four feet above his head. Like... In, in ways you can say, well, they might have realized they had arguably the best player of the generation inside, get the ball into him quickly. And it doesn't matter what sort of ball it is. If he wins one out of three of those, he might cause a bit of damage. He scores five points. He sets up Okanada's goal. And perhaps the worst thing that happened was that it started off decently. Like, it, it, it didn't get off on the, the worst footing. And that when Kerry actually had a few balls that stuck in the first 12, 15 minutes, they were like, well, we are doing this for the full game. I think we could actually do like a three hour podcast on this one game because just when you're going through the teams, there are so many different nuances to it. But like, let's start with what you're talking about with Gooch and the, the tactic. It worked brilliantly at the very start of the game. It works until he's blinded. Like there's a good half an hour period of the game where I'm not sure he could see where the ball was. But that yeah. first ball that comes in, you forget like Gooch because he was a superstar from the time that he was 17 or 18. He was actually a big man. He was a tall, athletic he had a brilliant spring. So he can get balls over people's mm. heads. And the hand pass for the Okanaja goal is sensational. It, like it, it loops and drops to just the one point where Okanaja is going to be able to get that ball and drop it onto his foot. And again, Darryl Okanaja is finished. It's sensational. Is this a year after Darryl Okanaja's kicked 12 points in the Ireland final? Yeah. Yeah. So like an all-time brilliant full forward line that Kerry have in this game too. Like, Jesus, what a game. It was unbelievable, and I think the we we watched it back uh, in Irish, and I think the commentator utters this line after ninety seconds: "Niaka Misha Alehida Hooch Reeve Aglaia Canish Naheran." I've never seen such a start in an All Ireland final, and that's after just ninety seconds of hits before that mm. first score. It was it was a Gooch that kicked, that kicked that first point. Yeah. It was, Moss O'Shea got turned over. Ryan Mellon got turned over. Mark O'Shea is turned over by Sean Kavanagh. McGuigan is turned over by Seamus Moynihan and it goes up the field and Gooch puts it over the bar. That's 90 seconds, lads. But, Jared, that moment you referenced, Gooch getting blinded, that's nine minutes in. And for me, that was like the first small battle that Tyrone had won in that game. Just on that, so uh, Gooch has written about this in his book and there's a good insight into this actually in the book. So I'm just going to go through this. He says, there was an incident in the 05 final that had an adverse effect on me for much of the first half. I was making a run in around a penalty spot, just trying to lose my man. Tyrone's goalie, Pastor McConnell, kept charging out towards me as if trying to block my run. On this one occasion, his glove made contact with my face. I got this horrible sensation of grit in my eye and immediately went down. And all around me became a symphony directed towards the referee, Mick Monaghan. Diving ref, diving, diving, diving. They were like squawking birds on a wall. I'm telling them to F off at themselves when Monaghan comes across to me and says, whatever you do, do not retaliate. So I'm sitting on my arse in Croke Park, barely able to see out of one eye, and the ref's telling me not to retaliate to something that hasn't, it seems, even merited a free. There are two umpires standing, hands behind their backs, no more than a few feet away. Don't retaliate? Well, what are you going to effing take action or what? I ask Monaghan. His silence is the answer I expected. And I'm rattled now. Maybe we're all rattled. Rattled and frustrated. Rightly or wrongly, I reckon I've just been taken out of the game, possibly in a premeditated move. And the ref's only answer is to tell me not to hit back. Tyrone were never going to go holding doors open for me, were they? We knew something was coming. But what do you do when it lands? Maybe the lack of anger in us as a group that day said more about us than we were willing to absorb at the time. Because all we gave Tyrone in return was just noise. Powerful stuff from Gooch and a fairly big acceptance for the Kerry psyche on that occasion, I think. Yeah. That's exactly what Tommy was saying. Mm. That's, I, hadn't, that's, I hadn't heard that before. I hadn't heard that from Gooch. Like it's, that's remarkable stuff that he, he's put it to paper like that. It, it like, what, was the bit about, what was the bit about anger? Or what was the last bit about the anger and our response? Maybe the lack of anger in us as a group that day said more about us than we were willing to absorb at the time. A lack of anger, he says. All we gave him to our own in return was just noise. Like, so you, you put that 
Right. When does do her uh, decapitate Paul Galvin? What point of the game is that? Or 20 well, minutes in, I want to say. In the first half, yeah, he gets a booking. Yeah, a booking. It was like, mm. and this is, this is just after, this is two years after Dearwood Marsden. Was it 03? Was it was Marsden? Yeah. So Marsden got sent off for far less. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, certainly the referee decided this is going to be an all time great game between two all time great teams. And I ain't getting, I mean, I couldn't remember his name. Uh, it was like, I'm not going to be famous at the end of this. Make money, yeah. Yeah, get up and play there. Um, <laughs> it was it, the referee back then was a bit random. Like I, 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 I ended up watching Leash Kill there yesterday, and there was two red cards for absolutely nothing in that game, the 2003 Lancer final. So I don't know what was happening with with the referee back then. Hmm. Probably got to the final and said, "Listen, don't be," because um, <laughs> William Kirby could have been sent off for two yeah. separate instances in the space of ten seconds and got a booking. I was like, yeah. "What?" Oh yeah, well, William Kirby absolutely still Steve Austin. Brian Wiggins. Two people. It's it's is it McGuigan and then it's Canavan as well. Two of them. He just <laughs> lands yeah. to the floor and like, uh, like go on. Talk. Like I, I just I just think that at some time, like after I saw the Kirby thing, I was like, right. So there was clearly an element of there was a violent streak in, in the Kerry players as well. Like they they they're not necessarily shrinking violets, but maybe it's only in these games that they looked like they are. I didn't really feel like. They were, to be honest with you. Like, and I, I can understand the lack of anger. Maybe, like, I don't know what Gooch wanted there. Is it a brawl? Like when Mick Monaghan tells him not to retaliate, that's a fairly standard thing for a referee to tell a player who's lying on the ground. I played in a full forward line and I've ended up with my hands holding my face plenty of times in club football where linesmen and referees haven't seen what's happened. A lot of the time it's been something accidental that ended up hurting me or something like that. But like, you're told not to retaliate. And if you retaliate, I'd be the one who'd be going to the line. So like... The, the thing about that moment is, and like, I think Gooch's words let us know just how important it was. That was nine minutes in. Kerry winning by two points. The play doesn't restart for three minutes. And when it restarts, Liam Hassett has been booked and Tyrone have a free inside the 45, the far side of the pitch. Kerry had been attacking and get turned over when, uh, when Gooch went down on the ground. Like that's three minutes later, momentum completely gone. Kerry's fantastic start is over. And if it was a premeditated move, geniuses. Yeah, like uh, I think that has to go down as one of the, the moments of the match. I'm not sure what else kind of sticks out to you. We'll get to Canavan's goal in a moment, but there are... Are we doing Are we doing moment of the match? Yeah, I think you wanted to come in on something on that Gooch incident finally there, Jer. Yeah, I just, I think that his point about the anger is that, like, so you think about this from Kerry's perspective. This is a game where they're going up to right the wrong of two years previous. This is a game where they're supposed to be reclaiming their crown as the best team in the country against a team who, you know, are a bit showy and a bit like uh, they got us that one time we didn't know about it and they've only other beaten other northern teams which we always beat them and yet when your best and talismanic player is getting assaulted nobody comes in to defend them there's no one in all in mentality that the Boyle and Meade team always had if one of us goes down all of us go to war and it was it was weird to see that because that's what I would have assumed the spirit of that Kerry team was and that's what it looked like against everybody else Maybe they were so far ahead of all the other teams that they didn't actually need. They didn't need that sense of, okay, we're all going to, if, if anybody comes after Gooch, there was no minder for him, I said, is essentially. There was no minder for him. There was no minder for the incident that's going to happen. They, you know, we know something is going to happen. What are we going to do when it happens? Nothing. And that seems to be what Gooch is saying, which, yeah. which is pretty damning, really. Uh, on that, Jared, there is one slightly similar moment that happens in the game. And it's uh, on the stream I'm watching here. It's about, there's about five minutes to go. And Tyrone are winning by two at the time. And a ball goes into Peter Canavan on the floor. And he rolls it and he wins it. And it, like, he scoops it off the ground. Like, but like, it's, he ends up winning a free. It's a soft enough free. But he gets absolutely landed by Tom O'Sullivan. It's a Philly Jordan ball into him. And Tom O'Sullivan and Aidan O'Mahony nail him. And they leave a bit on him extra afterwards. And four or five Tyrone boys come in afterwards. They don't lose the free. But you know, they're patting uh, Canavan on the back. And O'Neill slots it over the bar. Like, I don't know whether you have to start an all-out brawl sometimes, but there, there, there was no messing with Peter Canavan after he got nailed that time. No. And, like, Canavan, when you're talking about the dark arts, uh, I, I, at the last, I think it's the last second of the game, Canavan wrestles Gooch to the ground with a complete third-man tackle, which mm -hmm. obviously would be a black card now. There was no black card at that point. But they were going to do that. They were going to do whatever it took. I, I think that there's, like, a, there's that bit of difference. I, I, there's a ruthlessness within that Tyrone team that separates them, in my mind, when it comes down to who's the best team from that Kerry team. Kerry were undoubtedly one of the most lavishly gifted group of footballers and men that you've ever seen assembled together. But when it came down to the championship minutes in this match, 
Tyrone had that little bit more steel. On that Canavan pull down, and it's actually more to do with the Canavan goal, actually, because this is the only other passage I want to read from Gooch's book. And it's actually more of an interesting insight to Cooper and to the Kerry team. He says, Canavan scored a class goal on the stroke of half time from a mulligan knockdown. Then Hart took him off for a breather before sending him on again to close the deal. More evidence of how they were rethinking the game. We ended up chasing the game, and in the dying seconds, Canavan pulled me down with a virtual rugby tackle as I sprinted to take a return pass. Their best player, doing whatever it took, not giving a shit what anyone might say on that evening Sunday game. He'd been blackguarded enough himself across the years, so could you really blame him? And, like, I mean, I, it's almost the, the part there where he says more evidence of how to run or rethinking the game, which kind of stands out to me, just this appreciation where you're on the pitch and you're like, okay, this bunch of players who are on the opposite end of the line to us are doing things and thinking about the game of football in a more advanced way than we are, which just must be a huge regret for anybody who realises the talented teammates that he had, the talent he had within his own two boots, to think to himself, God, we've been out thought here. Like, it's, it's such a... a it must he be wins six shame. all Ireland's though. Hmm? He wins six all Ireland's, doesn't he? He does, but it, like two six. Like so, he he's on the the second rung of of uh, all Ireland carry winners. You know that the second generation down or the third generation down, if you want to include the nineteen thirties. Like I, I I just think that anybody who achieves big things in sport will always have what ifs. But this just seems yeah. like mm. a, a glaring what if. Like a, a, a sort of I can't believe we've been out thought once. We get a new manager, we get out thought again. We get another new manager, we get out thought again. And I, I just think 05, this was at its mo- most glaring that you look across and you, you just see what Mickey Hart has done. And I, like, I, I don't know how many more times I, I can say this, but like, it just must be uh, soul crushing for someone like Gooch if this is the way the thing that he takes away from this rivalry. I think that we can't forget how good the Tyrone players are. So, like Mickey Hart has not been able to do this with another group of players. And, you know, the, the black, the, the dark arts is not the thing that I remember Peter Canavan for. Like the goal and his, his final, the final score that he gets, which I think is the second last score of mm. an impossible, impossible angle. Uh, did he kick it with his left foot? Or, no, it's over his shoulder. No, right it's right. Yeah, it's yeah. wide. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's more than wide. It's my moment of the match and I want to come to that in a minute. Okay, sorry. I don't. I mean, I I, I hope it is why because that would just be sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> but I also, <laughs> I also wanted in the first in the first two minutes of the game, Brian McGuigan mentioned this in a piece he wrote for Football.com, which Tommy tweeted out uh, two days ago. Uh, he has this amazing pirouette where he gets the ball over his head and flips it straight into uh, McGuigan's path. And McGuigan hits the side netting. Maybe he should have gone across the goal. Definitely should have hit the target. But it was just this beautiful piece of skill from Canavan, which nobody remembered. I didn't remember it until, mm. like, I remember at the time going, Jesus, it's real pity no one's going to remember this. And sure mm. enough, I didn't. But then watching it again, you're like, that was amazing. Mm. Canavan was absolutely sensational. Well, and this is, the, like, this is last. I'm going to have to watch it back. I don't remember that. I'm going to have to look back, look back at that. First I'm five like, minutes. First five minutes. Okay, okay. I, I think, like, we just, again, I know we've mentioned this twice already, but we just need to come back to the talent on the pitch on this occasion. That, like, you can talk about 08, you can talk about the... I don't know, sometimes when it comes to these great GEA powerhouses, they are like ships passing in the night. That you kind of exactly. wish you got, you got a certain team up against another team at a certain point. You've got Peter Canavan uh, on the same pitch as Colin Cooper here. You've got Seamus Moynihan on the same pitch as Sean Kavanagh here. Like, the, like Gooch and Kavanagh only retired within the last five years. With Canavan and Seamus Moynihan, these are 90s icons. Like 2005 mm-hmm. is the perfect Petri dish for all these sort of things to happen. And we're so lucky that this actually happened in a final and that it happened with, on a perfect day, it happened with Mick McCarthy, or Mick McCarthy, Mickey Hart <laughs> being a, a bit of a genius uh, on this occasion. And with the, the, the kind of in sli- a trick up his sleeve, like I know that I'll never be able to appreciate this because I'm truly not neutral. I'll come into this as much as hard as I try. But it's the perfect situation. It's the perfect situation for any neutral coming to a final. The two generations coming to pass. Uh, and like it's not just passing the night on one occasion we're lucky that it's not no and it, this is like the proper what if these two teams had met like what if if Dublin if the if the current Dublin team were to play either of these two teams I mean I'd love to see exactly what would happen but the other thing they have in the background for context is that the Armagh side that Tyrone had to get over actually didn't get over like, how many replays how many replays I mean, did it take yeah and so they get over them in the semi final. Sorry, but they, they got beaten in the Ulster final that mm. year. And they got beaten in a load of the games. They got beaten every year in Ulster, essentially. Mm. 
and uh, and beat them in Croke Park whenever. Oh, sorry, the Ulster games are all held in Croke Park because um, Clonus were being rebuilt at the time. But like you forget that there's eighty thousand that Ulster finals around this this time as well, which you know, like this is a golden era for great teams coming together. And that that Armagh team, remember, are vastly superior to the Mayo team over the last decade or so because they managed to win in All Ireland. So like you're well, it's, Hall it's, of Fame Tyrone, Hall of Fame Kerry, Hall of Very Great Armagh driving them on as well. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. I, I was kind of trying to equate. Mayo to Tyrone, just minus the All Irelands there, given the arc of their <laughs> qualifier routes. But but maybe that's a stretch too far. Uh, Owen, I, I've literally forgotten one of the things that was in my brain that I'm going to come back to in a moment. But I would like to know, like I've already professed my love for Brian McGuigan and Philly Jordan as an 11 year old mad Kerry fan. Who were your heroes growing up? Because like this was Declan O'Sullivan, like running, soloing the ball, left foot, right foot, going up the field. This is for me. The one time, I wasn't privy to watching on Gwales to play all the time, but Darrow O'Shea doing what Darrow O'Shea does, Tomás O'Shea doing what Tomás mm-hmm. O'Shea does, and Mark O'Shea selling solo dummies up the field. Like, this is the three O'Sheas, like, on fire together in the one game. Not on fire, probably, but, like, they're all doing, they're all at the peak of their powers, let's say. Who were your heroes growing up as a carry kid? Like, it's a good point. like I mean, how good was that culture team to be on Gwales to the Nettle Ireland final at that time? Like, um, oh, the heroes, Seamus Moynihan and Colin Cooper, for me, absolutely. They, those two were uh, a class above everybody else. Like, and your point on the O'Shea's, like, I think that O'Shea got outplayed in certain aspects of this 05 final, but I thought Mark and Tomas were pretty good. I thought Tomas in particular was possibly Kerry's best player on the pitch in 05. But for me, it was, it was always about Seamus Moynihan, just yeah. the, his unbelievable <laughs> ability to really, like, he could see the future in my eyes. He knew what was going to happen. Like, you don't, don't worry. If you're 20 points down at halftime, Seamus Moynihan will know exactly where that ball is going to fall uh, at every single second in the second half, and it's going to be okay. He's Mr. Seti. He will turn this game around for you. Don't worry if things are going bad. Colin Cooper will t- turn things around for you in the second half. Except, of course, if you were playing against Tyrone, as, as it so transpired. Like, the, I, I don't know. There, there was just magic in both of those. Magic in very different ways. Colin Cooper, no matter where he was, he could get that ball between the posts. He could eke out a goal opportunity for one of his teammates. Whatever it could have been, Seamus Moynihan would just be a stopper because he knew where you were going to go. He knew where you were going to move. And, like, I think, really, uh, when you're sitting there in the Nally Terrace in 05, after the start that Kerry make, after 10, 12 minutes, you're like, okay, Moynihan's on song. Gooch is on song. This is going to be mm. a very good day. I think is testament to what Thoreau managed to do in the second and third quarters, which was just 40 minutes of the best football you're ever likely to see in an All-Ireland final. I think we just got a peek at our man Brushmore there, did we? Not necessarily, no. Call I'm only joking, I'm only joking. That's not, not going to do it. Who knows, who knows. Are, are we getting to moment of the match? Yeah, let's do it. What, what, else, what else have you got in moment of the match? Like, we've gone through Canavan's goal, uh, Gooch, and okay. uh, him going down early in the first half. What, what else have you got? Okay. My moment of the match, right? Like initially, I had been thinking it might be that ninety-second montage at the start of the game with all the hits because that seemed to sum up the intensity. But my moment of the match, Jer mentioned already, was Peter Canavan's point after fifty-eight minutes because the game swayed there in the moments beforehand. Darrow Shea, who we had mentioned, kicked an iconic. I think it was Darrow Shea kicked an iconic point. And next thing, the next camera shot is Mickey Hart lining up Peter Canavan to come on. Two minutes later, Peter Canavan comes on. Whoops in the 54th minute. And uh, what's the next thing that happens? Tomas O'Shea roofs the ball into the back of the net. Back to a one-point game. Kick-out comes out, and Dar O'Shea has a chance to level the game. He's to the right of the goals, and he drops it wide. It's a poor wide. Now, I, do, I actually think Dar O'Shea had a really good game in that game. And in terms, of like, in terms of like bossing in midfield, I haven't really seen a player like Dar O'Shea do what he did in that game in a long time. He like completely, he was a man out there. He completely dominated. Sean Kavanagh, was very quiet. And the McGinley, I thought, had a good game. Sean Cameron was quiet mm. in the first half. But Andy McGinley had a good game, but he was taken off. He was moved out of midfield as well. Like, I honestly think Darcy had a great game. And if O'Shea had nailed that point, it was a draw game. It was a draw match with 15 minutes to go. But he puts it wide. And it goes up the pitch. And Tyrone runs the field. Pascal McConnell kicks it out, runs the field. Stephen O'Neill gets bottled up. And he throws it back to Peter Canavan. And you have to watch this a couple of times. It's, it's, it's a shot over the shoulder. It's the, the angle where you see that he's actually eight yards out from goal. And the ball arcs towards the point, the post, and he curls it. And Seamus Moynan is waving frantically that it's wide. You're saying he can see the future. Maybe if there was Hawkeye, it would have been a wide. Because I, I still can't tell. I'm looking at it right now, and I still can't tell. It's rolling here in front of me. I can't tell whether or not that ball went over the bar. But for me, moment of the match, 
winning the 2005 All Ireland final. That's the moment that defines a decade of Gaelic football. Uh, it doesn't make a difference in my eyes. I like I, yeah, I think that's definitely wide. Tyrone are going to find a way to win this game. I think. I think they are, like on, as as much as it pains me to say it, I think Tyrone were always going to find a way. Um, I don't know. That's you, you're giving yourself comfort there. That's like, oh sure, look, best team won. Don't let's not think too much. I think it's a cop out. I think it's. I think Kerry bottled this game, lads. I think Kerry bottled this game <laughs> on numerous occasions, honestly. And I'm not saying but, like bottle. Bottle is a word that gets trolled and allowed around a lot. I genuinely think I'm just part, like kind of in six or seven yards out there when he curls that over. But like Kerry bottled this game. They absolutely bottled, bottled it. And we're talking it in about preparation arrogance. or bottled it in. No, forget about the preparation. You've 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 made a great point about the arrogance and the the legacy issues of Pat Bland's comments. That's all well and good. They bottled. They bottled this all Ireland fun. Like whether it's Gooch saying the lack of anger, Kerry had numerous uh, chances to win this All Ireland final. Both teams are at their absolute peak here. They're at their peak in the decade in 2005, and Kerry could have easily won this All Ireland final on a number of occasions. I think Kerry could have been at their peak this year. Is what is what I would say with uh, that comment about bottling, actually, which is what I would say that if you were going to question something seriously, it is the preparation, and it's actually one of your own points about Donaghy. Like I think Donaghy mm. is part of the peak of Kerry in that decade and he was available but not used in that particular year perhaps because they didn't feel they needed to use him because they went through the front door because they were All-Ireland champions like they turned to Donaghy in a time of need and that was when they got the best out of his management that's when Jack O'Connor was at his best when his back was up against the wall as it was uh, early in 2006 so I think I think that's where it fell down but I, I hear you I definitely do like I it's such a hard thing to put your finger on it and whether or not you can actually call that bottling as in like given the conditions that were there, given the game plan that they were given and the preparation they'd done until that point, they go out that day, do they choke? Like, Maybe. Like Maybe. Hearts, after, hearts after playing this party trick. Hearts after bringing off Peter Canavan at half time. He has, as you said, all around anyone talked about in the second half was Peter Canavan. He'd scored that goal. Like, you guys are questioning what's going on here. He scored his goal before half time. All anyone was talking about for the first 18 minutes is why has he brought off Hart? Or why has he brought off Canavan? Is he going to come back on? He brings it back on. Come also, Shea buries the goal. A point in it. Dara has a chance to level it. He has a chance to level it. And somehow he misses. And somehow Kerry allowed Tyrone to squirm their way up the field. And for Peter Canavan to, I don't know how he puts that ball over the bar, but that's the winning of that All Ireland final. We, we watched this on the TG Car replay, but there was no score and there was no time. So when, I, how long, so I watched the second half going, how long's left, what's the score? So then, it's, it's, it is 23 minutes into the second half here. So there's 12 minutes to go. When Canavan scores that point? Yeah, so 58 minutes, roughly. What was very weird, I thought, and quite pronounced in when they're behind, is that Kerry, Kerry become a jazz ensemble where a couple of lads are working together as opposed to Here's our plan of action here. So we just did Gladiator uh, um, with Dermot Kennedy last week. And the, when they're all back in, when they finally make it to Rome, Maximus says, was anybody in the army? Let's form a, let's form a proper phalanx here and be organized. There was no sense of organization about what Kerry were trying to do. There was no Maximus. It was Dara on his own. It was Tomas on his own. It was Declan on his own. And uh, they were getting overwhelmed by the swarm of the opposition's team. I thought that was quite pronounced in the second half. From way, er from way early on. So you're saying 58 minutes when that's... Yeah. Like for the last 12 plus, I don't know, there might have been no stoppage time. There probably wasn't. Maybe two minutes, if you're lucky, for an All-Ireland final, an extra bonus three. There was no sense that, okay, well, let's work the ball to Gooch and try and do something. Even when Mike Frank Russell drops the ball in, with the last kick of the game for it's like what what is what are you trying to do here lads how are you trying to fashion an opportunity it was it was too random and certainly i mean if they had Donnie on the bench it's madness not to use i think that there is uh, a case to be made for that exact point but also for the first half i think that that was symptomatic of Kerry throughout the entire game i think it summed up to go back to my moment of the match canavan's goal by the fact that owen mulligan that is owen mulligan's goal as much as it is peter canavan's piece of magic dust who is marking owen mulligan paul galvin paul galvin and, yeah, that didn't uh, make any sense. Wow. That, that yeah. I think, sums up uh, where Kerry were at in terms of reacting to Tyrone at that moment. They just were, found themselves in sixes and sevens at too many vital moments. And it was the moment of the match, which you find you have your wing forward on one of the most explosive forwards in the game at the moment, who sets up Peter Canavan for an outrageous finish. So, uh, like, it's obviously not Galvin's fault. It's where was your full back line? Where, where was the, the covering? What, what was the plan? that ended up 
in Paul Galvin and Martin Yon Mulligan. Yeah, and who's Martin Canavan? Like, how, do you, how does he lose you on that run to the point where it's actually Galvin who is the one who marks Mulligan and then has to leave Mulligan and go and chase him um, to, to try and uh, do a full-length diving save? Like we, wax, we wax lyrical about the dubs and their running lines and their backdoor cuts, and rightly so. And Kieran Kilkenny hand passing the ball to Conor Cannon and Paul Mannion stands out in their memory. But when you pause this, where Can- or Mulligan has his hands on the ball and kind of makes that cut, it's just poetry. Hmm. It's unbelievable. Uh, we should talk about our secret man of the match. Can't remember who actually. Who is got- the actual. I'm trying. Yeah, I'm know. actually trying to. I wasn't like Stephen O'Neill was obviously footballer of the year, but I don't think he was uh, man of the match in this occasion. Like I presume Peter Canavan would have been man of the match given the the vital scores and given the uh, narrative around him. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. McGuigan. I I've got like McGuigan, and the McGinley, and Ryan McMahon, Ryan McMenamin would have been the three that I would have picked out here. Uh, as like obviously McGinley gets taken off, so it's between McGuigan and McMenamin outside of Canavan for me for a secret man of the match. Um, is, this the year, is this the year that McGinley plays with the broken neck? Is it, is it this year or is it is it 03 where he gets his vertebrae broken early on and Peter Canham is over in his face going, get up, get up, don't show them you're in pain, don't show them you're in pain. Peter Canham, that, that definitely wouldn't have been 08 anyway. No, so that rules that out. So it's either this one or... Uh, I think that was 2003. It was, I think it was, it was okay, okay. All right, well, I was going to say he played pretty well for somebody with a, <laughs> uh, a the break. 2000, lads, the 2005 All-Ireland Final Man of the Match was Muggsy, Owen Mulligan. Okay. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Owen Mulligan. Yeah, yeah, he had a good game. He kicked... kicked uh, good game. Beautiful point. He had a good game. Definitely a good game. A couple of bad wides. Didn't he have a couple of bad... Um, he definitely, definitely had one or two bad ones. Dewar had a bad wide. He had a bad wide. Um... McGuigan only had a bad an wide. unbelievable goal chance. The goal the chance comes minute. off the... That's the one that... Ah, the build that's, up to that's that. Brian McGuigan that, or Brian Mulligan's? Or Owen Mulligan's? McGuigan's goal chance comes Sorry. off the incredible yes. bit of skill from... Um, that's, that's, 17, that's 17 minutes in. And how... Like, do you remember Stephen O'Brien's uh, goal chance for Kerry against Dublin last year? The save. Oh, yes. yes. The save. Yeah. And... If you pause that, and it might be harsh pausing these moments, but like Stephen O'Brien buries that straight down the middle of Stephen Cluxon, and he has so much room to slot it to his to Cluxon's left. Once again, here Brian McGuigan is coming in, and I wouldn't question a man of Brian McGuigan's talents, but I don't understand how he didn't open his body and slot it into the corner. He tried to bury it into an angle that wasn't there at the near post. For me, Brian McGuigan's my secret man of the match. He kicked three points. He controlled the game. He was a conductor. Uh, like the narrative this year. Off him. He had what? The head taken off him, yeah. He, he, got a, he got a yellow card with about 10 minutes for? to go. I couldn't see it. It was, kind of, uh, it was kind of dragging a man back. It would probably be a, a soft black card nowadays, but he got a good yellow card with 10 minutes to go. His three points were just, ah, they were delicious. They were like, his first one, he, he has a ball and there's two men in him. And he doesn't even sell a dummy. He just steps to the right slightly. It's like a half step to the right, turns to the left yeah. and slots it over. His second score is immediately after Kahneman's goal before half time. just as important. Um, like Stephen O'Neill was, was magic. Duhur was great. Philly Jordan was superb. But there's times in that second half where Brian McGuigan is just, like Kieran Kilkenny perhaps, say it's 50 yards from goal and he's just passing left and right and he's just pulling, pulling the strings. And like the narrative this year was that Tyrone, if they got McShane back from, from Australia and if they got uh, Conor McKenna back from Australia, they might be contenders for the All-Ireland this year. But back then, if Tyrone had not brought Brian McGuigan home from Australia, if he hadn't decided to, as he wrote it off the ball, to leave his girlfriend behind for a couple of months in Australia and leave Kevin Hughes behind and come home to Ireland, uh, Tyrone would not have been the team of the decade and they would not have won that All-Ireland final. I want to put forward, I want to put forward uh, somebody for a secret man of the match and I hate that I'm about to do this, but I think Mickey Hart has to be secret man of the match on this occasion. Sure. This, this is his Brian Cody 2008 moment. This is the best performance he ever got out of this Tyrone team. This is possibly the best All-Ireland final performance from any team this century, perhaps of the last 25 years or even since the 90s. It is that good. It is an unbelievable team performance with a game plan that is so flawlessly learned by everybody on the pitch. Magic dust across the pitch. Uh, it's so many talented players and 90% of them 
played to their very maximum, I would have thought, on that occasion. I would allow them for, for an error here or there. I'm not going to include errors in this, but in terms of what they brought, in terms of their intensity and in terms of their commitment and their preparation for the game, close to perfect. The Peter Canavan trick, the most famous, because it was one of the most successful tricks ever played in an All-Ireland final. In terms of giving a manager credit for how an All-Ireland was won, I think Vicky Hart deserves as much credit as anybody for any of the All-Irelands we've seen recently for this one. And for me, he's my secret man of the match. That's a good shout. He was very mm. good. Uh, Philip Jordan was sensational. The, the last point is just like, oh, we're playing keep ball. Hang on a second. Thanks. I thought he was, uh, he was all over the place. Nice little bit of a, oh, ref, he got me, he killed me. And then I'm like, uh, I'm okay again. Um, I thought Philly plays was, the ball. Philly plays the ball to Muggsy as well for the goal. Yes, he does. And uh, it's like into that corridor of uncertainty. Uh, he was great. Sean Cavan in the second half was good. As you said, in the first half, he was kind of like, certainly getting to grips with the game. Um, I, like, I, I thought McGuigan was man of the match. And in my head, certainly back in the day, I don't know why Mulligan, I think Mulligan obviously had scored that goal against Dublin that year. And mm. um, yeah, so I'd be interested to know who picked that. But like, <laughs> let's, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, tr- trending and most jarring <laughs> moments from the game. Uh, so, like, trend stuff that kind of stuck out to me, anything we watch on this time, we kind of know. We've got the, the loose slash breathable jerseys. You've got brand names like Azuri and O2, up and all the hoardings, which kind of uh, spoke mid-2000s to me. Like, the one thing that really actually does, does jar with you when you watch this year back is just kickouts. Like, it seems like such an obvious thing, not just from the fact that they're taken halfway up the pitch after every yeah. score, uh, but also just how much of a lottery it was. Like, really? Like, you're picking a side of the pitch. Maybe you're overloading it by one or two bodies, but that is as technical as they got. And, like, it just everything looks really, really aimless. And very true. And I think that's why Darrow Shea was able to dominate the skies in which he did. Can I add one more thing to trending? Yes. And, like, let's bring them back. Uh, TG Cahard, producers, uh, editors, if you're listening, you know, whoever's running the, the show on the GA, if you're listening here, Reverse angle replays in, show, in slow motion. Yes. They were absolutely class. They were brilliant. And I don't know what's happened or what way they've tweaked the cameras or the angles. They're not the same anymore. They were so good around that time. I, I don't know what it is. It's like, it's like a, you know when you, you look at some, uh, a photo in a mirror and it just switches the angle completely or it flips it completely. I don't know what it was, but it was, it was class. Well, like, I, I'm not sure that they actually provide as much as you think. I think they made it look nicer. And maybe on, on certain occasions, they actually did provide a little bit more, like you probably got to see a, a ball going over the bar and things like that. I'm not sure they actually provide as much, but they're definitely noticeable. They're conspicuous when you see them. Reverse angle. I like them. Do you, do, you, do you feel like, so this is what, 2005, and we're now in 2020. Do you feel like we haven't actually progressed that much in terms of what you see on a match day and what you experience as a, as a TV watcher now from then? Like, when you consider, hmm. you know, uh, did smartphones exist in 2005? I don't think they did. I'm almost certain that they absolutely the didn't. IPod. The iPod was just out, I think, a year or two, wasn't it? That was in the crappy quiz last week. The iPod, yeah. yeah. The so iPod, 02, yeah. 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 So we're still a bit away from a uh, good, good point of research to do for next round of uh, questions. <laughs> like, when you think about it, we should, we should now be seeing way more than we are seeing, right? Like, that didn't feel like it was a game from... A different era and 15 years of extra no. technology it doesn't feel like we've got there yet no no it's true like is is this a, a reflection on sport in general or is it a reflection on gaa in general it does feel that there's more cameras at premier league grounds and premier league is like when we were doing the battle of highbury in the classic game club uh, a while ago it did feel that we were de- deprived of content or deprived of angles whereas now if you watch the premier league game it's just ridiculous to uh, depth that they have whereas here kind of feels like a fairly similar television experience like reverse angles are different there's obviously yeah. been a dipping of the toe into into the water of actually having the little thing appear where you can see the kick out and the, the replays in the corner yeah, 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 yeah. Doing that. but you two boys consume a lot of American sports like there obviously is a lot more that can be done yes yeah you can have loads more like the referee cam in rugby first couple of seasons they had it it was like wearing a dead weight and now it's this tiny little camera that the referee has on them and you actually, you know, you're, you're getting, a, 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 they kind of went away from that in the last 18 months as well. So look, I, I just think that there is way more that we could be seeing. The fact that Hawkeye didn't exist, for example, you know, like uh, 
it's great that we do have Hawkeye, so we would now know that Peter Kahneman did score that or kick that wide. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I would like to see a quantum leap forward in terms of the stuff that we're getting because we deserve it. These games are brilliant. Mm, we should be sure. Can I, add, can I add one final thing yeah. to most jarring? Uh, it's a moment that happens. Uh, it's it's maybe the last five minutes or so, and I'm pretty sure it's the hill. And I tweeted a photo of it. I don't know whether you boys saw it. I'm just going to flip my camera here. The smoke and ban, to my knowledge, was brought in to effect in 2004. <laughs> this is 2005. Look at the boys there. Is it, are they, One, I can't see. Two, three. Can you see that? <laughs> are they Tyrone boys? They're Tyrone boys. All three or four of them. And there's a fellow over here in the corner as well. All having a smoke. Yeah. No, they don't uh, have to be. There's no chance of them getting. Um, having to pay any fines. What I found most jarring was the Kerry fan and the Michael Jackson mask. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was f- freaky and weird. I think by that stage, we all knew that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. I'm pretty sure that it was fairly common knowledge at that stage in 2004, 2005. And uh, still, to show up and to, like, you know, it's not, it's also, is it, uh, it's thriller era Michael Jackson. Um, it was just, like, why do you go to an Ireland final and make yourself uncomfortable by wearing this sweaty mask all day? Not a, not a great look. I uh, know it was before we had smartphones, Jared. Nobody knew anything about anybody else. So uh, I'm going to give that Kerry fan <laughs> a, a free pass. There's also a Tyrone <laughs> fan that gets, uh, uh, like, in the middle of Doher making a speech, a pants like some fellow who's got a, a bit of space after the pitch invasion on the pitch. And he's there, like, lighting up a flare. And the guard, the steward, walks over to him and is like, What are you doing? And the, the flare is lighting. And the, the steward is like, come on, get out of the stadium. And he's like, I kind of want to watch and uh, see the, the, the speech. And unfortunately, the camera pans away, so we never actually get to see uh. what actually happens to that. Uh, just, just one final thing before we get into like, the, the final few points, just on the most jarring. This is always a subject we talk about with the passage of time. So when I see Kerry being really naive, that in itself is jarring because you watch a team from 15 years ago as opposed to how advanced Gaelic football is now. But I think even if you're watching the game in 2005, it is jarring to see two teams in an All-Ireland final with two very different ways of going about a game. Kerry so much off the cuff, Tyrone off the cuff in places, but really with a far more concrete and suitable plan to how they wanted to go about things. That, for me, jars so much, and it's just hammered home with the passage of time. Right, final things that we get into here. Uh, sliding doors. Where do you want to take this, lads? What do you want to talk about? What, what, like, what changes did Kerry win this game? What does this mean for the wider context of football in the mid-2000s? What changes if Kerry win this game was they do a five in a row. Like, they're the greatest team of all time. They, that Kerry team were absolutely sensational. Now, what happens if they win that game? Maybe Donny doesn't get into the team and they don't end up doing five in a row. I don't know. Like, but that's, what was up for grabs was the title of, like, all-time great team. And Tyrone went in and they seized it. They went and they took it. Kerry were like, oh, that might be important to us down the road. Maybe we'll, we'll get another chance sometime. Oh, shit. Jerry, you're forgetting one thing. The only thing that was up for grabs in this game was team of the decade. And I, I'm sorry to hammer that home. I'm sorry to keep going back to it. But if Kerry win that, no matter what happens in the rest of the decade, Kerry your team of the decade. No, it's it's not even even Eugene Sliding McGee. Sliding doors. Even Eugene McGee, who would like to stick the stuck the boot into Kerry time and time again during this era, even said in his report after the game that the team of the decade conversation will take some time to actually uh, pan out before we make any assumptions. Now, I give I give you a bit of advice. We did a piece last year with Ricey and Kieran Donaghy. Go back and listen to that, and then tell me who's the team of the decade. In fairness, if I was here with Ricey, I'd also give I'd also say whatever the hell <laughs> he wanted to hear. <laughs> So that I, I am safe and I can walk out of the pub or wherever you filmed it safely. That, that's all that matters to me. And I don't actually believe that, that Donaghy actually fully meant uh, Kerry were not the team of the decade <laughs> on this occasion. It's five All-Irelands to three. That is one of the important, that is for me the most important metric for this. Of no. course, of no. course, of course. No. Rowan no. versus Kerry uh, rivalry is an important factor, but it is not the yes. be-all and end-all. It is not the be-all and end-all. Yes, like, it is. Like, yes, how, it is. How, how, this is a decade, it's not, the not one year. All, but it's it's eighty percent. It's three nil. If it was all- one nil, and it was the only game they played was this game. If that was the only time that it happened, you'd be like, ah, look, it was one game. Caught Kerry a bit cold, but Kerry won more All Ireland. It's, it's like I'm sorry, but they that that was the best team of the decade, and this was the game where it was up for grabs. Kerry have no, no. cram. There's no there's no comeback because Kerry went through there the is. front door. Everybody was fit. You had Moynihan still on the team. You had Dara Kanaja still on the team. You had Brosnan. Dara still on the team. 
Well, the, no, you can't complain. Tom Sullivan it's likes it. Ah, the, the, there's a lot there. Like, first of all, the whole backdoor notion and like going through the front door being a massive advantage. Kerry themselves uh, have proved that a couple of times that that is just a nonsense, that actually going through the front door is the better option and that Jerome were this frail, uh, old, oh. f- past their uh, peak beasts that were there for the taking and Kerry couldn't even do that. Like, that's just nonsense. That's just not a, a real argument. I'll, I, will let, I will let you come at me with your, with your remaining team of the decade arguments before I, I just have a couple of points to make on that because like we, we are obviously not going to reach a conclusion. I'm not yeah, going to move are, my we, position we, and you are not going to conclusion. move your position. I accept that. It's two, two against one here, Owen. It's 3-0. It's, 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 it's not 2 it's, it's, it's Donahue. It's 3-0. It's 3-0. <laughs> they, they played each other three times in the course of a decade. Ten yes. years. Oh, Ten yes. years. In all our finals. In all our finals. years. Oh, three. But like, yes. it's not but like... You can't, oh, like it, it, it's an important factor, but like... It's three occasions. They were spread five years apart. Those yes. games, like yes. you three to and away. It's, a fine, them. it spanned a generation. It spanned the whole decade. It spanned the decade. Oh, three to away. Yeah, it wasn't like it was oh three oh four oh five. It was oh three to oh eight. Like what? Like I hear what you're saying, and it is it is a factor in all of this. But I say what is actually a bigger factor than that is Kerry winning five All Irelands. Kerry getting to winning back to back All Ireland, something Tyrone couldn't do. How can we Two never? Ju- Cork. How, how can we never a Cork team that beat Cork or a Two Cork team Mayo. that beat Tyrone? Two against Mayo. A Mayo team that beat Tyrone. Like are, are these teams? Are, 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 are these teams so? Are these teams so pathetic? Uh, and they actually beat Tyrone. Like, where does that leave Tyrone if these teams are so pathetic that they actually found themselves in a position where Cork and Mayo actually beat them? Like this whole notion that Kerry gets slapped down because they beat Mayo and Cork in all Ireland. Ah, okay. Just, just, That's just, fair. It's just a little, it's, it's a little weird with me. Well, How can we never I judge? Mean, like, okay, so, sorry, just one thing. I really want to make this point. Whenever it comes to the Tyrone versus Kerry team of the decade argument, people like you will always make the argument about, well, here is how Kerry fell down in this argument. Totally fair. How can we never analyse where Tyrone fell down across the decade? Well, it's primarily Tyrone fell down. Um, they came up against that Armagh team. Like, and so they, they all, they, their passage to get to play matches against Kerry involved overcoming a very, very, very good team. Well, hold or, on a minute. Can I, can I just challenge that? Armagh, Armagh were vastly superior to Cork. I'm not, I'm so not the, challenging the Armagh not, point. I'm not challenging the Armagh. Mm, vastly superior, not sure. Better team, give you vastly that. Vastly superior. I'm, uh, I don't know about that, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, Cork How got many All-Irelands did Cork win in, in that decade? Well, they got to two All-Irelands. Eventually, like, at I mean, the end. Like they got to two All Irelands, they they end up getting over the line in 2010, which is actually the product of the 2000s. That is a product of the 2000s Cork team. 2010 uh, okay. is a product well, of, of what they do okay. in the years previous. They beat Tyrone in 09. Tyrone are All Ireland champions at that point. They get to two other, uh, they get to two All Ireland finals in that time. I think Cork are an absolute. Tyrone are finished in 09. I think. I think. Oh, oh, I think 08 is the end of that Tyrone team. I think that's that's fair. Well, enough. okay. Can, can we, we definitely agree on that. But just, I just want to challenge you on one thing there, where you talk about Armagh being. The, the 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 low ebb for the Tyrone team. That's not true. Like the low ebb not for the, the low ebb. The, the low like no, okay, not the low ebb. The challenge, as in the challenge. So they have to overcome that challenge. I didn't say low ebb. Okay, what, so on, let's sorry, let's analyze the low ebbs of this uh, this decade for Tyrone. Like scoring six points against Leash in two thousand and six when you're All Ireland champions. One of the most pathetic defenses of an All Ireland title that there's ever been. Like that, at that point, two thousand and six, it's like all right, we're the best team in the country. Time to defend our title. Let's do it. Six points they score against Leash, knocked out of the championship, and their backs, their arses are up against the wall. Come back the next year, they're back. Tyrone are going to be back. Come up against Meath. No offense, Tommy, in an All Ireland quarter final. Meath beat them. Hey. Like, they, like they, when you're like, okay, I'll, I'll accept there were low points for Kerry in this decade. Meath in 2001 was their low point, without question. Outside of that, dessert, like, oh, it is, is clearly uh, the, the, the second moment throughout this decade. But you've got the first All-Ireland of the decade, the last All-Ireland of the decade. You've got a back-to-back in the middle. Tyrone, an unbelievable team. And yes, this is a debate. Of course it's a debate. I'm not saying it's not a debate. But I just think because of what Kerry achieved and because of the lows that Tyrone stumbled upon, Kerry edged this debate. Can, can I just say... Uh, uh, like you've made a compelling argument and I've heard it a lot I've sit beside you in the office and we're in the office together I've heard it before but let me just say one thing if, if this is all going to be factored into the debate about team in a decade another thing that has to come into it is the context of the county themselves and how the county okay. themselves view themselves how do the county themselves stand amongst history like when we talk about the Mount Rushmore's we're leaving it up for debate for each county to decide upon who is on it so Mayo for example have folk heroes Dublin mm-hmm want to split them in four. Cork have all their legends as well. But when it comes down to it, what did Tyrone have 
before the, like before yeah. the, this these minor winning teams in in the nineties. What did Tyrone have to to say? That's where we want to get to. That's what we want to aspire to. I remember reading a couple of the autobiographies back then and being struck by the underdog nature of that story. And for me, when you talk about the low points from Tyrone, that just shows how human they were as a team. I'm getting a call here. Sorry. That just shows. That just shows how human they were as a team. Kicking six points against Leash. I understand that. I can see how that can happen to a team. Like, in 2005, Kevin Hughes had left. Brian McGuigan had gone. Mm. It, like, they didn't hang around. They had their lives. They'd won their All-Ireland. They were top of the world. It didn't matter. Like, they, they were dealt with that devastating blow of Cormac McAllen in 2004. Like, the, the whole story of the decade isn't how many All-Irelands. Like, the, the numbers that. matter. The numbers matter. But it's the narrative. It's the story. It's the fact that Kerry, when they, they had it in 2005 on, they had the chance to do it. This was not a yeah. debate. If Tyrone had two All-Irelands, it's not a debate. And Kerry had the chance to squash Tyrone that day, and they didn't. They let it go because Tyrone had something on them. Tyrone had their mark, and Mickey Hart had their mark. On those occasions, 100%, Tommy, couldn't agree. And, uh, like, I mean, <laughs> like, but I, in, in, in fairness, in fairness, it, it, is, like, it is a huge factor. Like, I'm not saying you, you brush off the championship meetings that they had with one another but there are other factors at play there are significant other factors at play what I will say is that of course that Tyrone team within their own county will be more revered than this Kerry team will be remembered in their own county because of the competition they've had from other decades for example but if you're comparing one team with the other boy what an what, what a brilliant collection of players they both were I just think Kerry just edges it just about, and like this was a, this was a debate right basis? away. This was a, this more all Irelands, more all Irelands, and, that, and that's and all that matters. No, doing back to back all Irelands, actually having sustained greatness from the start of the decade to the end of the decade. Tyrone, there you do their, accept that the Munster Championship is complete bullshit versus the Ulster Championship, right? So already, already, it's it's more difficult to win coming from their province. They they're already handicapped. Like so, the value of an all Ireland coming through Ulster. It's actually more difficult, just like by any metric, subjectively or objectively, it is more difficult to win all Ireland's coming from Ulster because of the way the football championship is completely irrationally organised as a result of how the Brits decided the county system was going to be and whatever the provincial lands that Maeve stole when she got the brown bull. I don't even remember. I don't even know the mythology around it. But for whatever reason, it's much more difficult to be in Ulster County and Windies. And as Tommy says, rightly, this is their first ever All Ireland. That means that's a so much more difficult thing for them to do. Coming into the decades, you already had a team that was festooned with All Ireland winners backboning the Kerry team. So, and you know what? Maybe, maybe a greater cause, sir. Maybe a greater cause. You know, like actually, that that explains why Tyrone were always added a lot more than Kerry were in their big occasions. A much bigger cause. It's like, right, we've got up to the hill once. Let's prove to everybody this was not a fluke. That's that's the cause they had in all five. Whereas Kerry, it was like, let's prove to everybody why we're actually the best team in Ireland and we're the best footballers in Ireland. Like, they're two very different causes. There is a, a lot more determination that can come from the Tyrone cause, I would have thought. Yeah, and, and I would say that that's a significant failing from Kerry. It goes back to Gooch saying, we just, we couldn't, we couldn't match that. We weren't as good a team as this. And how can, how can you, as a, as a footballer, view your achievements over a period of time to be superior to a rival who beats you every time you play them? I, like, I think if Gooch was to sit down and actually talk about the whole decade as a whole, I don't think he would say that Tyrone were the better team over the course of a full decade or the better county. The, the, the team of the decade, I'm not sure would he actually come to that conclusion. I think in 05, it's indisputable. Can we, can we go back to the point earlier on when you were talking about Gooch and you said you felt that he must think that they underachieved? Yeah. Why do you like, think that? Well, like, I, th I think there's a... It's, it's, uh, <sighs> It seems like a bizarre thing to say. Five All Irelands in a decade, and to think that there was an underachievement. You, it's, be, it's because you, I really think the, the, the game, the game we've just watched ourselves. I don't think any of the three of us can say that Kerry were as well prepared as their opposite number on that day. They were as well set up. They were as well drilled. And that, for me, no matter who you are, no matter what county you are, that has to give you a lot of regret. That actually, we have the talent to go out. And as you say, Jar, put yourself in the ballpark for a five in a row. Like, and even after this, even after this, like that, that is why 08 is 
I'm not ready for Royce, first of all. I'm not ready for Royce, and I never will be ready for Royce. I I, 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 I never will be ready for Royce. Like, this is the one that that would would get you down forever. Like, because, like, for me, me, 09 is, is this is the best carry team that we had. It's very similar to 08. It's not too dissimilar to 07 as well, but you have this unbelievable run from 06 to 09. How did you lose in 2008? How? I don't know, Tommy. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember this game. Ger- to Ger- genuinely, the longer Owen talks here, I actually think he's talking himself out of actually back and carry for team team in a decade. No, that's, that's Owen, not the points, happen. seriously, Owen, the points you're making there about preparation, they're excellent. Like, yeah. like, they're really good, you, but they're actually the serving. They're serving the Tyrone cause here. Like, like my point, if, is, like, if my point Kerry, is that Kerry underachieved and still won five All Irelands. That is yeah, that's the mark of the team of the Owen, decade for me. There's such a thing. They, there's such a thing as a soft All Ireland, and if you combine that with a, a team as exceptional as Kerry's were, talent wise, yes, yes. talent wise. But like this Kerry team is very different to this, this Dublin team. This like, whole the, notion like, of soft All Irelands, like, like I mean, it, it's to do with. Kerry's utter dominance in All Ireland finals that has translated into soft All Ireland. Let's face that here. This is the most outrageously talented team of this decade. And when they were challenged, question. they lost. They crumbled. They were brittle. They didn't have the anger. Like uh, I mean, we, we want, that's only that's only in the Tyrone games, really. Like they were they were challenged by Armagh. <laughs> they they got that revenge. They were challenged by Dublin on a couple of occasions. <laughs> they were the Armagh beat them in the All Ireland final. They were one eight to a point up against Armagh. They had them on the rack and they got beaten. So you've, like, shifted the no. goal, you've shifted the goalposts from like our man. I'm not. You said they beat our man. Like just our man. Okay, so they beat our man at some point. point. You know, oh, it's like I'm actually okay, gonna, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to shut up after this, right? But a little earlier, about uh, probably two hours ago, Owen made a wonderful point about arrogance after O3 and how Kerry didn't learn from their mistakes. Can I just make one recommendation for people of Kerry? Take that decade, the 2000s, and put it in. 2003 as an example. So why don't you just learn from the 2000s? And perhaps now... Yeah, five on Ireland. Terrible, terrible the 2020s, times. The 2020s. The 20, but listen, you had your 32 in 2003 and you didn't follow it up in 2005 because you didn't learn from the mistakes. Learn from the mistakes to the noughties and win, be team of the deck in the 2020s. That's what I'm saying. You're not learning from your mistakes. You're bringing that arrogance into the debate here again. You're not, you're not learning from My it. Last well, actually, I, I would actually My challenge last... that completely, Tommy. I would actually say that Kerry went from being the best team in the country clinging on to the legends of that era to the point of 2012 when Jim McGuinness comes along and beats them deservedly and all of a sudden Kerry find themselves in a position where they're like oh crap we've got to find new talent pretty quickly here and they managed to annex in All-Ireland in 2014 which is a very on Kerry like if you're making the point about the 2000s that Kerry had to be by far the best team in, in the country to win the All-Ireland they weren't the best team. They weren't perhaps in the, in the top two teams in 2014 and managed to win in All-Ireland. I would contend that they have learned from their mistakes already. Fair. And uh, they've just happened to come up against possibly the best team of all time over the last five years. One last point, and I'm going to leave it to Gooch on this. We, it, uh, whatever that, the second um, extract you read out, another example. Oh, Jerry, you we... appear to have... Uh, you appear to have lost your there. I'm not I wonder, sure he, I wonder uh, has his battery died. <laughs> uh, it, it possibly has. Uh, I will actually read out the last passage of Gooch Dude. here because uh, it's a point uh, that he wanted to touch on somewhere here. Uh, Canavan scored a class goal he talks about. Oh, Jerry, you're back? Yes, I'm back. Sorry, yeah. you, were about, you were about to make a point there from uh, Gooch's extract. What were you going to say? Yeah, what was, what was the line he said about another way of Tyrone leading the thinking or being ahead of the game? So he talks about uh, Hart taking Canavan off before sending him on again. More evidence of how they were rethinking the game. We ended up chasing the game in the dying seconds, and that's, uh, that's your point, is it? Sure, look, Tyrone rethought the game, but uh, Kerry were the team of the decades and lost every game they played against. <laughs> well, Jim so McGuinness completely changed the game, so is he uh, Donegal automatically the team of the 2010s? I mean, there's a, there's a case to be made for that. That's hey. not the <laughs> argument we currently have. That's, that's a mean, conversation for another day, boys. Right, uh, okay. We're a long way into this. We've got to do over I think the dubs are probably... Uh, this, is, this is underrated... For me, underrated as a game, I think uh, as a Tyrone team, I think like, uh, what do you mean? Like, like well, I, I think that as a team, they're perfectly rated. But I think as a game, this is underrated. I, I think as an All-Ireland final, this is perfectly rated. It defines a generation of football. It's got the perfect quality of bite, uh, the perfect mixture of bite and quality. And there's two teams at the height of their power. And it gives us the answer to the question we've all been looking for. Jerry? I think 
I think this Toronto team might be underrated. They may actually be as important a team in the history of Gaelic football as any other Gaelic football team. From that population base to win three All-Irelands to get to the point where they've come from nothing to, to, like, to make everybody, including Kerry, think that they don't even understand how the game is being played or evolving is like a seismic explosion. And when you think about it, we're watching an All-Ireland final and we just watched one when we did the uh, Galway Kildare game, where it's two brilliant teams and one of them isn't Dublin. Like it's going to be a very long time before we see an All Ireland final with two brilliant teams, two generational teams up against each other, and one of them not be Dublin. So, uh, absolutely sensational. I would recommend everybody go back and watch it. And absolutely, Toronto the team of the decade. Uh, it's been. A very unpleasant experience watching this game back. It's been even worse chatting with the two of you. You've been terrible company, uh, but I hope you at home enjoyed this. This is the Classic Game Club. Cheers, lads.